Okay, cool. Well, um, I think that's plenty of time since we don't have a, a lot of time to let people arrive or, or whatever. Um, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Some people will miss the, uh, the wonderful introductions that we're going to do. Um, hi, everyone. I am Ryan Blue. Um, my co-presenter is Chow Sun from Apple. Um, so just a, a little bit of background about us. Um, we've worked together in uh, several different communities. Um, the Parquet community comes to mind where uh, Chow is actually an Arrow committer. I think you're actually Hive PMC and, and a Hadoop committer as well, as well, right, Chow? Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah, and, and as well as uh, the Spark community. I'm a Spark committer and I've been on uh, data projects for, for a while. Um, I'm coming from Tabular and like I said, Chow is, is at Apple. Um, and we've been working together on a project uh, for adding storage partitioned joins to Apache Spark, which is what we're going to talk about today. So um, I want to start off by talking and giving just a bit of background about um, joins in general. <laughs> and then we're going to dig a little bit deeper into Spark. Um, so I, I think we all pretty much understand like what's going on in a SQL join, but there's one um, there's one thing that I want to point out about joins um, in particular that make them parallelizable, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today: is how do we more efficiently do run joins in parallel? Uh, so you know, Spark and Hive and all these systems, they're they're basically you know large distributed systems running SQL plans, um, and that works uh, because in a join you don't need all of the rows all the time. Um, what you actually need is all of the rows that might match the set of rows that you have. So this is basically how um, Hive and Spark run their joins. They can divide up the work um, across multiple tasks um, using basically a, a shuffle to get the right rows to the correct task and then run a, a small portion of the join there. Um, so this is very much uh, related to storage partitioning um, because it's all about how do you distribute the rows to the tasks uh, in order to be able to, to um, perform your join correctly. So the, you can think of this as a, a very simple example. Um, if I have uh, two tables that I want to join by email address, I can take all the email addresses that start with uh, the letter A through N and send them to one task on both tables. Uh, and then I know that everything in that, uh, that group can be joined. And I can ignore the rest of the alphabet, which is M through Z. I can send those to a different task. And I can just basically divide up the data using a predefined strategy uh, in order to make sure that all of the rows that match one another are handled by a single task. In Spark, uh, and actually like all of the MapReduce uh, databases since uh, like the, the early days, um, we basically mostly do this by partitioning. So what we'll do is we'll take the join key hash it, mod it by some number, and then distribute by that to get uh, somewhere between 10 or 20,000 different uh, slices of work and know that uh, because we're using both sides of the join, uh, hashing this, the join key the same way, all of the rows that might match end up in the same place. And that sort of brings us to bucketed joins in Spark. So let's uh, go to the next slide if possible. So the problem with this situation um, is that these joins uh, are expensive, right? Um, basically, the situation where I was talking about where you have everyone hash the keys and then send data uh, to a remote machine, that's, that's a shuffle. That's really, really expensive. So each mapper or map side task writes out a ton of little shards to disk, and then the reducers go and grab from however many mappers there were. And what we end up with is an N M times N network connections to pull data from remote nodes. Um, so we have IO for every mapper to write their data to disk. We have network IO uh, and a ton of connections here. And um, it, it's just a, a very expensive thing. 
So then we also have to shuffle that, or sorry, to, to sort that data um, and, and it gets very uh, costly. So one thing that we can do is actually uh, try to pre-position the data uh, on at least one side so that it is already uh, where the reducers need it to be. Um, and that is basically the state of the art in bucketed joins in Spark. Um, okay, so I think next slide. All right, so yes. Now the big idea for bucketed joins in Spark is let's take our internal hash function and say, assume we're gonna create a hundred buckets of data for any given join and just go ahead and make that the partitioning of our table. We'll use Spark's internal hash function. We will uh, use some fixed number of buckets and then pre-create all of that and then detect at runtime that the data we're reading from this table is already distributed the way that we would have distributed it and we can just skip the, the shuffle for that one side of the table or potentially both sides of the table. So all we're doing is, is basically pre-shuffling the data, writing it to disk that way, and then using it in that, that, um, that fashion, which is, is really great. It, it works quite well, um, but this is pretty limited in, in Spark uh, in a few different ways. Um, so number one, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the first thing is we're, ahead of time choosing some number of buckets to shuffle into, which is not a great situation. <laughs> um, because if I store my data in 100 buckets, um, I can't really change that. You know, Tables in, in Spark don't support changing the number of buckets or, or anything like that. We also have to have that number of buckets uh, match the number of buckets that are, is configured uh, for basically all shuffles or at a minimum that one shuffle at, uh, at runtime. And so if that doesn't match, Spark Bucket to Join all of a sudden tries to shuffle an entire table worth of data and just breaks very, very easily. Um, number two, it relies on Spark's internal bucketing function. So that's just whatever Spark happened to do to think it's distributing data pretty well. Um, notably, this doesn't match the, the bucket or hash function used by Hive, which means that Hive bucketed tables can't be used in Spark. And there's this long-standing issue of how do we implement bucket joins for Hive tables in Spark? Well, we haven't been able to because Spark is basically saying, well, if it already happens to match, we just won't shuffle it rather than creating uh, a system for plugging in like how we want to redistribute data and uh, you know sort of brokering that exchange. And Chow's gonna get into that a bit later. Um, third, uh, we don't support data source V2. So this is only a data source V1 thing and it's kind of uh, hacky because it's built into file names and stuff like that. So um, it, it's not a well-supported, well-designed feature in Spark, and we're hoping to change that. And then the, the last thing I'll mention is, um, what if we think about this problem a bit differently? Rather than thinking about how do we pre-position data so that it's already distributed the way we want to, what if we think about it as matching up shards of data that already uh, exist? So this is where we, we can think of this as like a date function. So if I'm joining two tables uh, by timestamp or, or something like that, um, if I know that the rows for one side of my join need to match in time the rows for the other side of the join, then I could potentially use other partition functions, not just, um, not just bucketing or hashing. I could say, if, if I know that the timestamps are going to match, then I can match up my day buckets, or sorry, my daily partitions or hourly partitions as well. So we wanna sort of generalize this concept into not just bucketing, but storage partition joins, where we can match up certain partitions from storage that are guaranteed to match one another. So moving on to the next, um, I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, transforms and, and how data source v2 tables are structured. Um, data source v2 is a new way of plugging in tables to Spark. Uh, 
And rather than only using uh, identity transforms or, or um, physical partition columns, um, it allows you to specify a transform for a column. Um, so you might say, you know, I want to bucket by some ID column, or I might want to store my data by a date derived from a timestamp column. Um, that's something that you can express in data source v2, and it gives us a lot more power to hide partitioning from the user. Um, in this case, what it gives us is a way of, of knowing the relationship between uh, a column that you might be joining by, some ID, and how we stored it on disk, the bucket. And that's something that's really powerful. That allows us to expand this concept um, to storage partition joins. So uh, this, I, I should mention, mirrors the concept of hidden partitioning in Apache Iceberg. And in fact, we, we actually added this so that we can support the hidden partitioning in Iceberg, um, which is why we, we structured data source v2 this way. All right, next slide. So the, the last thing I wanna do is sort of lay out what is a storage partition join um, and, and what are we targeting with this work? So first of all, we want to use data source v2, right? Um, we, we want this to be a way of extending the bucketed join concept, but generalizing it for any partition transform and you know potentially uh, any way our tables are pre-aligned we want to be able to take advantage of that. Um, we, again, this is all about avoiding a shuffle um, if both sides of a join are uh, partitioned in a compatible way or potentially taking how one side of the join is partitioned and using that to restructure the other side of the join rather than just assuming that everything might match. Um, we want to be a lot more flexible than, than V1 bucketing and um, we, we definitely need these custom bucket functions so that we can support hive tables, iceberg tables, or whatever. The, the engine doesn't actually get to choose how the storage layer has uh, laid out the data, and we want to be able to take advantage of however uh, that has been done. With that, I'm gonna hand things over to Chow, who's gonna take you through more, uh, more information on this and, and what sort of things we're, we're thinking about supporting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so um, for the rest of the talk, uh, we'll just use a few um, examples to demonstrate how this feature works in Spark. Uh, let's start from the, uh, some, um, some simple cases first. Now, you can see that here in this slide, we have two tables, A and B. And uh, suppose both A and B are partitioned on colon C, which is of timestamp type. And uh, they're also using a transform called days. Right, and also we can see on the right hand side that both A and B have four partitions, and uh, you know all the partitions have the same partition values, which are from the January first of twenty twenty to January the fourth of twenty twenty. So you can see that um, suppose we have this query select star from A join B, uh, A dot C equals to B dot C, and since the join is on the column C, and both A and B are also partitioned on C we can see that the partitions are pretty much perfectly aligned with each other, right? So in this case, we can see that Spark doesn't really need to shuffle the data because the data is already co-partitioned. <laughs> so this is actually pretty similar to the case of bucketing, except that um, right now the bucket function is changed, right? Instead of a hash function, it uses the custom days function. But you may ask, what if my tables are not perfectly aligned? You know, in the real use cases, you may have different number of partitions on uh, on both sides, and how do we um, how do we deal with that case? So let's first look at the case where the partitions do not exact match, right? You can see here uh, we still have table A and B on both sides, but right now table A has three partitions, but table B only have two partitions. Right, and since Spark requires that both sides of the join to have the same amount of partitions, in this case, Spark cannot leverage the storage partition join. Instead, you know, it has to um, reshuffle the data to the same number of partitions, and so it can then do the perform uh, join operation. So, how do we uh, tweak this um, situation so that Spark can still leverage storage partition join and avoid shuffling? The solution is actually kind of simple. 
you just need to create empty partitions so that both sides will match. Right? In this case, we can, we can have one empty partition on table A and two empty partitions on table B. As a result, you can see that the, um, after the ID those partitions, both sides will match and the spot can still um, leverage split partition join the avoid shuffling. Another case is what if my partitions are not ordered, right? You can see that in the previous cases, the date, uh, the day value for the partitions are ordered uh, in a nature order. But right now, you know, um, the orders are different. So because basically when data sources report partitions to Spark, they do not necessarily need to guarantee the input partition ordering. So as a result, Spark basically needs to be aware of that and that they should sort the partitions according to their nature order. And after that, um, you know, both sides, the partitions on both sides will be perfectly aligned and Spark can trigger the storage partition join. Okay, um, now let's talk about some more complicated cases. One uh, common situation is what if my join keys do not match the partition keys? Let's take a look at example. So in this particular case, we still have table A and B um, and they are partitioned on two columns, C1 and the C2, right? We, we are doing days transform on C1 and a bucket transform on C2. And suppose we have this following query, which is select a star from A join B, uh, A dot C1 equals to B dot C1. So you can see that the join key is only C1, but the partition keys are C1 and C2, right? So they, they, they do not match each other. So in this case, can we still leverage storage partition join in some way? We still want to avoid the shuffling basically. Um, so the solution is actually, uh, we can have Spark to group the input partitions on C1 um, so that the partitions are clustered on the C1 and uh, which is the join key. So as a result, we can potentially avoid shuffle. So how do we achieve that, right? Suppose we have um, table A and B partitions in uh, as shown on the right-hand side. You can see that, um, you know, um, A is partitioned by days um, both A and B are partitioned by days and the bucket, right? And uh, uh, suppose for table A, we have four distinct values for C1 and uh, two distinct values for C2 because it's taking bucket, um, it's, it's basically taking mod two on C2, right? On the, C, on the, on the table B, we have um, same uh, four, four distinct values for C1, but four distinct values for C2 because we're taking mod four on, on B. So in this case, but we know that, you know, the join is happening on C1. So we can really just uh, group all the partitions with the same value of C1. So as a result, we can see that um, after the grouping table A and B have four partitions, right? They um, basically we've merged all the distinct or different values for the second, um, for the second column, which is C2. And so um, Spark is perfectly happy with this case because again, we have uh, matching partitions. We have the same number of partitions. And so Spark can still leverage storage partition and join. And also for the grouping case, we can do a few optimizations, right? First of all, if we know that uh, the input query does not have join or aggregation, or that the partition keys do not overlap with join keys, then we can just skip the grouping because we know we know it's it's not it's, it's not useful to do that. And also, um, you know, at planning time, Spark will know what the join keys are, so it can push that information to data sources. So data sources can use that to make optimization decisions. For instance, Spark can tell data sources that there is no join or aggregation. Right. In that case, data sources can just um, avoid, can basically just, uh, you know, do different optimizations such as the bin packing to merge input partitions across partition boundaries so that you can, um, you know, use better input partition size. Um, so, um, so to improve query performance. And lastly, uh, grouping operation may only be needed from one side of the join. Um, 
we can use a new feature called a partially clustered distribution, which we'll talk about later, so that you, you, can, you only need to, need to group partitions on one side instead of on both sides, like in this case. Okay, we talked about the case where the join keys are a subset of partition keys. And there's another case, which is the join keys are a superset of partition keys. So let's take a look at example. In this case, suppose both A and B are partitioned only by C1. And we have the following query, which is select star from A join B on A dot C1 equals to B dot C1 and A dot C2 equals to B dot C2. The question is, can, can Spark still use storage partition to join and avoid shuffling? The answer actually is yes. So let's look at, let's take a look at this query, right? Because the join is on C1 and C2, to avoid shuffle, we need to make sure that for any two rows from A and B, if they, if they have the same value for C1 and C2, they should be in the, in the matching partitions from A and B respectively. Right, so you know each partition from A and B have an index, and we want to make sure that they have the same index. This can be satisfied if we distribute the rows from A and B by C1 and C2. Obviously, if we do that, then um, the, the condition can be satisfied automatically. But this can also be satisfied if rows are distributed only by C1 or C2. Right, if you have if you distribute all the rows by C1, that means that C1, the partition for a particular value of C1 will contain all the values of C2 that matching. Uh, and then, you know, then it's obviously the C1, if C1 and C2 are equal, then they will end up in the same matching partitions. So we can see that um, in this case, we can still leverage story partition join, but we have to modify Spark in certain ways because at the moment, Spark. Um, 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 basically, with Spark, that's planning and uh, inserting shuffle, it it is done in a very restricted way. It only uh, avoids shuffle when the join keys exactly match the cluster keys. But we want to basically relax the constraint so that in, um, for this particular case, you can still avoid inserting shuffle. And then we have some more complicated complicated cases. For instance, what if my partition transforms do not exactly match, but are kind of correlated? One typical example is that if what if we have I have um, on the one side I have a bucket on ID um, with four buckets, and on the other side I have bucket on ID but with two buckets. Can we still leverage this feature and avoid shuffle? Let's take a look at the example, right? Um, in this case, we still have table A and B, um, but table A has four partitions and table B has two partitions, right? And since the number of, bucket, uh, number of partitions do not match, by default, Spark may need to shuffle. Um, but we can do a few things to fix that. You know, we can either colonize the four buckets of table A into two buckets of table B, therefore matching B's buckets we can also repartition the two buckets of table B into four buckets matching the number of buckets in table A, right? So those two solutions will, will work. So for the first case, in terms of coalizing, we can, um, you know, we can basically combine the four buckets in table A into two buckets, right? This actually, uh, in terms of implementation, it's kind of easy. Uh, we just need to combine them. But the downside is that it will reduce parallelism if B only have a small number of partitions, right? Imagine that perhaps A, instead of four partitions, it may have like, um, you know, 256 partitions. So in that case, you're combining 256 partitions into two partitions, which is not, which will not be good. The other solution is called repartition. Uh, in this case, we're performing repartition on table B instead. Um, so you can see that as a result, B will have four partitions. And uh, this obviously can give us better parallelism because we're increasing the number of partitions. But the downside is that we need to stream the same buckets on B multiple times because right now you can see that 
we're kind of like um, reusing bucket with ID equals to zero twice, right? One for the bucket ID equals to zero and the other for the bucket ID equals to two on the table A side. So we also need to be careful and, um, and the filter those unmatched rows from table B. <laughs> so this, um, so in terms of invitation, this will be more complicated. <laughs> so uh, the concept of coalizing and repartition um, can also be extended to non-bucket functions. For instance, in data source V2, we have days and hours transform. And we know that uh, they are they are correlated, right? Because each day can be divided into twenty four hours, so we can apply the same concept here, and uh, and uh, and uh, um, and uh, and uh, avoid the shuffle. And uh, lastly, what if I have too much data within a partition, right? In the real use cases, you may the data may not be evenly distributed across all the partitions. Some partitions may get a lot more data than others. How do we, um, how do we basically, to, um, to 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 do certain operations so that data can be more evenly distributed? Let's take a look at example. Um, in this case, we still have table A and B, and both of them have four partitions. But you can see that um, um, each partition is associated with a number. You can think this number is like the, the unit of cost to process the partition, right? You can see that in table A, the last partition, which is generally the fourth, have 300 units, which means that it's more expensive. And on the table B, you can see the first partition has 200 units, so it's more expensive than others. So how can we, um, by default, basically, you know, we, we still have to, we're gonna use like four tasks to process this. But the task would get much more data, so it will uh, it will delay the processing time and also cause the Intel query time to uh, to suffer. So the solution we can do is basically to divide those skewed partitions into smaller partitions, as long as the other side is a complete partition. So you can see that um, after the splitting. The table B, table A, um, the last partition generated the fourth will be divided into three partitions, each with 100 units. The same for table B, you can see that um, the first partition is divided into two uh, smaller partitions. And so um, then as a result, we get, um, we get um, more parallels on, on both sides. And uh, but the downside is that the same amount of the same data may need to be processed multiple times. But usually, sometimes you may uh, people may trade uh, better parallelism uh, than you know than processing the time the data potentially multiple times basically. So um, in this storage particular feature, we also want to introduce a new concept called partially clustered distribution. This basically allows uh, data source V2 um, to specify uh, whether the input partitions are partially distributed, like in, uh, like shown in this case. Basically, um, you can uh, allow the data source to distribute the rows across multiple partitions rather than having them in a single partition. Um, this in concept is kind of similar to optimized skewed join in Spark um, adaptive query execution. But um, but in 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 the AQE optimized skew join is actually done by Spark. The so data source implementer does not have control on this um, on this distribution. Um, so so let's see if I'm okay. I have ten minutes. Um, so um, you know. As we as we talked about before previously, that uh, in, uh, potentially by default we need to uh, do partition grouping on both sides of the join. But with this feature, actually, we only need to do grouping on one side, right? So let's re reuse the example that we shown before. In this case, we we know that um, you know we are joining on C1, but both tables are partitioned by C1 and C2, right? But we only need to um, do the grouping on one side, which in this case is A. Right, and so because we can, uh, because table B is partially distributed, um, we can still leverage 
partition adjoined to, uh, to, to avoid the shuffle. And uh, another major benefit of this partially clustered distribution is that data sources can plan their input partitions with proper size so that they can potentially fit in memory, right? If you can fit the partition memory, Spark can potentially avoid sort merge join and uh, choose hash join, which could be much cheaper, right? Because sort merge join basically needs to have a sort extra sort step. While for hash join, you just put the smaller side into a hash table and then you stream the bigger side. Um, so this is another advantage. So let's, let's summarize um, what uh, is storage partition join, what we propose here. So um, in summary, um, a V2 data source can expose partition and the distribution information to Spark. And uh, the new feature called storage partition join can leverage the information to avoid shuffle whenever it can be applied. Right. This is a more generalized form of bucket join in data source v1. And lastly, um, partition, a partially clustered distribution is a new type of distribution that allows Spark to allocate data sources across more tasks um, to achieve better parallelism. The current status of the project, um, the SP is already out uh, with the link, and we're targeting Spark 3.3 release. Uh, the a PLC is also available. We're actively working on this feature, basically. So that's all I have. So right now I'm taking questions. Yeah, um, if you guys want to, if there are any questions, uh, just paste them into the chat, or I think we might be able to have you join. If you have a link to join and you want to ask a question with video, happy to, to do that. Um, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, could you post the SPIP link in the chat, Chow? Yes, yes. And I think you can also stop presenting because we can still yeah, see you. Me... And any other questions, feel free to just uh, paste them in the chat um, and I'll moderate. Okay. Cool. Let me paste the link for the SPIP and the PLC. Yeah, there's actually quite a, I think, long road to getting all of this in. Um, I, the the POC, I believe, is just like inner joins um, and bucketing functions because a lot of the um, RDD operations that you need to say like up sample and, and things like that um, don't exist yet, but it, it's really uh, some great work to get it going. Okay, we have some questions. Can group by and where clause on partition keys also leverage the storage, par storage partition mechanism? I pissed the wrong place. I can answer a little bit of that, which is um, the where clause does get pushed down to uh, storage partitioning. Um, so at least in Apache Iceberg um, and, and basically any V2 data source, you can optionally say, I accept filters and then the, the source gets past filters from the query and it can go and, and do more efficient planning. So Apache Iceberg takes those filters, selects partitions, um, and then within there actually uses uh, column level information. So min max stats, um, number of nulls, number of nans and things like that to uh, push those, those predicates down to the data source and get pretty fine grained matching. Um, the group by um, is, is kind of funny. Uh, so aggregates, we are also looking to leverage this feature for aggregation where um, because we're essentially having it so that the V2 data source can tell Spark how its data is distributed, that mechanism can, can be used for the exact same thing. We can say, I see that this is distributed by hour and I'm grouping or you know, aggregating by hour. Therefore, uh, we can uh, match that expected distribution. Um, that already exists in data source V2, but we're changing it to be a bit more um, general uh, so that, that we can uh, leverage it differently because the, the partially clustered distribution is a lot more flexible than what Spark already requires, which is a completely clustered distribution. So all of the data is in a single task for um, a group. Uh -huh. uh, let's see, the next one is, hey Chow, you said this kind of, uh, will avoid the shuffle and smaller files. Can you explain a bit more? 
I'm trying to understand this question. Um, so um, by small files, you mean um, too many partitions? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what's, how do you? Maybe, maybe, uh, <laughs> yes, too many partitions. Good, thank you for um, okay, okay. the time. Um, so um, I think it's re not really about small files, this feature. Um, it's basically, um, I think one, one, one case it may apply is, um, you know, the partition grouping, right? Basically, if you have too many, um, I mean, I mean, if the data source report many small partitions, right, and uh, Spark potentially can, uh, but if 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 the join key, um, basically Spark can potentially apply grouping on those partitions to get bigger partitions, and uh, uh, apply uh, you know the story partition join and the white shopping and so on and so forth. Um, that's mm -hmm. one thing again. <laughs> I'm sorry. It wouldn't that be I, I, a separate I, I, responsibility, right? Like storage partition joins should probably try and create as many partitions as possible or as many tasks as possible, and then rely on AQE to combine those into larger task sizes. Yes. Yes, it can potentially rely on AQE. Can potentially help as well, but uh, it will only. Uh, it, it won't be applied at the beginning, right? When you have, um, you know, uh, at the beginning, you have those, it uh, also report those many partitions. They only do after the uh, shuffle phase. Oh, oh, so, you're right, AQE. So you could do that here then in your analysis. Um, if you have like 100,000 input files that are tiny or something like that, you could combine them uh, up to larger levels, right? If yes. you're over partitioned yes. in one table, yeah, I, I think that that would work. Yes, yes. And I, that's the same principle as AQE, right? Because you're just saying that we need this data to be co-located, um, and we can combine those into larger tasks. Yeah, potentially. I think potentially, um, you know, um, data sources can report partially clustered distribution, right? With those many partitions, but Spark can um, perform, optionally perform grouping uh, if necessary. Any other questions out there? I think we are about at time, right? It goes to 1050. I don't actually know, and my calendar's not up. <laughs> yeah. It's it's 10.50 now. Yep, it's 10.50. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. I hope that was a, a good session. Um, we're available on the um, Apache Slack uh, area. Uh, what is it, Workspace, Slack Workspace. Um, so you can reach both of us, I think, in the Iceberg Room uh, or just individually. Um, I'm always happy to, to answer questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Have a great conference. Bye, everyone.